Hello, friends and watchers and listeners and everybody else out there in comic book land. Welcome to the first monthly Nerdventures comic book club discussion featuring patrons from the Nerdventures Patreon as well as the lovely Amani from Get a Cat, Get a Horse. Welcome, everybody. Hello. Whew. Hello. 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 Today we are joined by Amani, my partner in crime uh, in the Get a Cat, Get a Horse podcast. Yes, Say indeed. hi, Amani. Hello, everybody. And nice to be here. Nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> and we are also joined by Kenneth. First name Kenneth, last name unknown to me, and I will not broadcast it. But uh, Kenneth, could you introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners, talk about your comic book cred, um, and uh, a little bit about how you have come to join us today? Okay. Hello, Nerd Ventures. I'm going to talk about my comic book street cred here. <laughs> um, maybe a little older than you guys, but uh, I have uh, been a comic book fan since the early 90s. Okay. I was in junior high school, so <laughs> uh, goes back to then. I was a uh, comic book fan during those dastardly nineties. With the, I was about to say, you saw some shit, man. You yeah, saw some I was going to ask about that. What was that like growing up? Hot in the garbage. Trenches. I saw lots of hologram <laughs> covers. And, yeah, yeah. You know, tin foil and all kinds of crap. So <laughs> it kind of turned me off to comics for a little bit, and then I got back into it. So. Awesome. And uh, what sort of stuff are you generally into? Are you mostly like a, a big two kind of guy, or do you bop around with with all kinds of stuff? What's your What's your jam? I'm uh, pretty diverse. I like pretty much anything and everything. Okay. Who? Well, give me give me like a uh, like a favorite writer artist. I know it's I know that's a tough one, but if you had to pick yeah. somebody, what do you what do you like? Who do you like reading and, and uh, looking at? Uh, I'd say reading. I'd probably say uh, either Dan Slott or uh, Grant Morrison. Okay, solid choices. Interesting. Yeah, cool. I actually yeah. am not a big slot. I don't have a lot of knowledge of slot, but I know he spent the vast majority of his time writing Spider-Man stuff. Oh yeah, but I, I don't. I don't really know it that well. But Grant Morrison, I love. And what about art-wise? What's your art-wise? I mean, it's been a while, but I'm still partial to Todd McFarlane's Marvel run. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Awesome. So I was born in 1990, if that <laughs> dates me at all. And uh, so I was not around for the 90s resurgence, but I think we're almost kind of living through a similar thing right now with the amount of variant covers and holographic lenticular bullshit that's going on. But that yeah, but better art yeah. now. is a subject for another day. <laughs> mm. All right, excuse me if I take drink breaks every once in a while. So today we are going to be embarking on a discussion of this comic book right here that is Superman Red Sun. Uh, is it backwards to you guys? Because it's backwards to me, but maybe it's broadcast. No, it's right, yeah. Okay, it's then I'm just backwards. <clears throat> um, this was the book that we picked for our first monthly book club stream. We partially picked it because it's so short and um, honestly we announced this book club so recently so it just kind of like fit in with that in a really good way. But um, also I think it is one of the books that a lot of people will get into if they are kind of looking for Superman stories or if they are looking to get into like graphic novels in general. I feel like this is something that gets um, bandied around a lot as being a quality quote unquote read for a new reader and a new Superman fan. So what was your guys... Oh, sorry. Before I get into that, let me acknowledge that we are going to be completely and totally spoiling anything to do with this book. This is going to be a book club in the sense of discussion-oriented stuff about you know the story and everything. So if you do not want to be spoiled on this, look away now. Otherwise, please feel free to join in the conversation. We will be taking comments in the YouTube comments, acknowledging that, and uh, hopefully it'll be a great discussion. So what was your guys' exposure to this book prior to coming on this um, this little book club cast? Had you had read it previously, Imani? Yeah. Um, so way back when, when I was taking just intro art classes, a professor of mine, uh, his name's Jake Parker, he writes comics, much younger um, age comics, but he writes comics, and he recommended Red Sun like four or five years ago before I really got into comics. So when I started buying, like it was one of the first things I picked up and also one of the first things I read. And I think what you're talking about, it being, it's short, it's Superman, like there's a lot of recognizability to it. It seemed like one of the easier places to start, for me, at least to read. So I read it like at the very beginning of my comic book journey. Okay. And Kenneth, where would you have placed this in your, you said you reread it for this 
past, but previously you had read it as right. Yeah, I, basically through word of mouth, I'd heard that it was a great book, so I decided to finally pick it up once you know numerous people had told me to to read it as a recommendation. Mm. Awesome, very awesome. So I have with me the trade pack paperback version. I believe there is a deluxe hardcover, but I have not seen it. Um, and I and I think the page count is only like six pages different. I don't think it's. Uh, of much substantiality. Uh, it's hard to find. <clears throat> oh, is it? It's a rare one. Yeah, yeah, it's not not easy to find. Interesting. I did not know that. So, um, Kenneth, if you if you wouldn't mind, unless you don't feel uh, comfortable doing it, could you give us like a little synopsis rundown slash like your over your overall thoughts on what this story is? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you basically a rundown of what I think yeah. about it. Go for um, it. First off, I'll say you really don't have to be a Superman fan really to enjoy the book. Uh, as long as you have like a basic knowledge of the mythos of Superman, I think you can get it. Um, I do like that there's shades of gray all through this. There's really not a good or a bad side in, in this, in my interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the alternative twist. I like that it's something completely different from what we're understood to be Superman. And... Uh, I just like the alternative history of it. Um, being a history student myself, I, I, I like how they kind of twisted everything and kind of threw everything in a dish and made it totally different from what you know. Awesome. Uh, very excellent. And Amani, what was your overall impression of it? Um, overall, I have a lot of the same feelings about it as Kenneth. I think it is a really strong book to recommend to new readers just for what he was saying about... There's a lot of... Um, you get a lot of reward for not knowing a lot about comics you know knowing who lois lane is who green lantern is batman etc lex luther you you are rewarded for knowing who those people are and it makes you feel like you're really like engaged with the book which for somebody who had just started reading comics was really nice you know especially considering sort of the fear of having to buy you know thousands of issues and read through history to really get to the good stuff like this is a book that doesn't make you do that um, and I think that is probably the most positive thing I can say about it. I really dug the art. I thought it was really good. I dug the writing. Um, having let it sit for a while, I will say the story, while being really great, didn't quite, wasn't quite as great as what, like, I had like a high when I finished it. Yeah. I don't know if you guys felt this way. Like, the ending is so good and it, it all Ooh, comes really? so Interesting. well. Interesting. I did not well, at least, ending. At least in terms of like getting to that last page and being like, oh, you know. Like, I definitely, for one of the first things I ever picked up, that was really rewarding for me. But having let it settle, like, I, I don't know how I feel about it anymore, you know? Yeah, I still, like, even, even though saying that, like, I still really, really like it. And I think it's a really strong book, you know? Yeah. But so I think way. maybe the shock value wore off. What about you? Well, I can understand that. Yeah, I, I enjoyed pieces of it. Um, when we get a little bit further into the breakdown, I'll talk a little bit more about my issues with it. But in terms of overall summarizing it, this is an Elseworlds book. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Elseworlds is a DC line that they do where they like throw continuity out the window. And actually, I think, Amani, what you just said is really interesting because there is continuity in this book, but it's the continuity of modern history and not comic books yeah Does that makes sense like it's it's a place where people could jump in and be rewarded for knowing who stalin is and who jfk is and who um richard nixon is because those characters are bandied around and and uh mick thrown into this mix but there's not a lot of like need to know dc continuity in general so i think you're right in terms of like new readership it's kind of an awesome place to ask somebody to start because all they need to know is like a general history of the Cold War era of the US. Um, the yeah. book itself is only three issues. I think they might be extra long issues. Are they? They might be a little bit longer than 22. But um, either way they are like premium format issues. It basically tells the what if story which you know Marvel has like a what if line and DC's Elseworlds is basically that for them. And it tells the what-if story if Superman had crashed when he was a baby in Russia instead of, like, Kansas or wherever small town is in the U.S. So do you think it, it succeeded in in showing that? Like, do you think the, the changes that it made were meaningful? Because 
let me answer that question first. I think that they were ultimately like not. I while I did enjoy parts of what this book did, I felt like a lot of what Millar was doing in this. By the way, it's written by Mark Millar and drawn by Dave Johnson and Killian Plunkett. Um, I thought a lot of what Mark Millar was doing was very surface level and kind of like fan servicey, and I don't think he went down a path that I would have liked to see this book take. Um, not to say that it was bad, it just was disappointing for what I wanted it to be. Anybody? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, he did play it safe. He, he could have definitely went a little further with it. Um, well, I think also, like, it's only three issues, you know? Right. I think for wh how long it is, he did a lot, and he did it really well in terms of just, like, page real estate. I, I would, I'm, like, really impressed with how much he got done. I get what you're saying, Will. Like, I think the, the argument that, you know, if Superman had been a communist, then he would have been, like, a controlling bad person is kind of, like, maybe a thin one. I didn't, it, I really disliked that argument. Honestly. Yeah, and I definitely know you well enough to know that, like, that's, like, your thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not, like, disagreeing with you. I think that, you know, he could have easily just said that a different family found him. And that, and you know, maybe his father was like abusive or something, and that's where Dark Superman came from. And maybe mm. that would have been even more interesting because that would have been more psychological than like political. Um, and but at the same time, I think Superman, the themes of Superman have always been like those ideas. Like it, he's always sort of represented America, right? So mm. taking him out of that American equation is an interesting argument to make about the character, I would say, because of how closely he is tied to, like, you know, who we are, like, as a country, you know? Um, and I think to, I think what uh, Kenneth was saying about how, like, there are no, you know, protagonists and antagonists in this book, I think that's really true, you know? I think it's easy to go in reading one way or the other depending on like what your political views are you know or whether or not you have ones you could you can make the argument that superman is still the protagonist for the whole thing or that lex Luthor ends up being the protagonist or that nobody's really the protagonist but like in the end everybody just comes out to shades of gray at least from what i saw and for me where the fun was was like the alt world like um stuff and like seeing how all of the other dc characters like came into this particular version of the Superman zeitgeist. Like, that's where I had the most fun. See, that's funny, because that's what took me out the most. Was really? That, like, I loved it. I thought it was because so Because I felt like it was just shout-outs for shout-outs sake. Like, when they're going through, like, the birthday, there's a birthday towards the end, or, or maybe it's one of the the editor of the Daily Planet is retiring, and they're like, oh, yeah, Barry is going to be late again. Like, that guy's always late, and, like, Iris is taking pictures, and I was like, oh, I get it. It's Barry Allen. Like, I see what you did there. I just, I felt like a lot of the shout outs were for the sake of like Mark Millar kind of jabbing you and being like, see what I did? See how I made Barry Allen late? Cause he's the flash. And I don't know, like to me, it didn't, it didn't connect in the way that I wanted it to. It kind of felt like it was just surface shout outs that didn't substantially change the, the like underlying format of what these people were. Does that make sense? I disagree. I thought it was yeah. super fun. <laughs> Kenneth, where do you yeah. land on that? I thought a couple of the characters are sort of forced. Um, but I do think that uh, Wonder Woman in particular I didn't like. I felt they kind of did her a disservice in this mm. book. I Thank you. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah, that, it was, That's it the was, one where I was like, yeah. okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Like, And, and Mark Leone, shout out to Mark Leone, my uh, former colleague slash overall partner in comic crime, that is. Um, he says, like, that's how Millar writes, and I, I think that's true. Like, and I, that's kind of the point that I came away with this that was hard for me is, like, do I criticize this book for what it is, or do I criticize this book for what I wanted it to be? And I think, like, ultimately it might not be fair for me to criticize it for what it wasn't, but I still feel that Millar, like, to me as a writer, always feels like he's writing surface level and looking to wrap things up quickly rather than, like, getting messy, like my favorite writers kind of tend to do. So, I don't know. That was just my feeling about it. But uh, do you want to get further into some of the alternate characters like Wonder Woman? Talk about her a little bit? Yeah, why don't we do that? Yeah. So, Wonder Woman is, is in this. What did you think about her and how she was used in this? I, I didn't like that she was smitten with Superman so much. She was kind of a weak character. And really, at the end, she kind of just fizzled out. Lois Lane had that same problem, too. It was sort of like all the women just kind of 
saw Superman once and were like, man, I could spend my life with him. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think from what other from what else I've read of Millar, like that's kind of a theme for his women is that, you know, no matter how much power they have at the end, they're kind of like, they're some total worth is like their romantic relationships with other characters, you know? Which is super disappointing. I agree with Kenneth. I think Wonder Woman is like a really great character and she was totally undersold, especially seeing how like Batman and even Green Lantern were kind of given their own like they, interesting yeah, slant. They were all right in this actually. Yeah. yeah, like I liked how they fit into what was happening with Superman and Wonder Woman was just like, oh, I just agree with everything he says. Also like I'm in love with him and like, I guess shitty stuff happens to me, you know, like. Yeah, <laughs> Batman which, beats me up and. <laughs> Which is like ridiculous. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Um, I think also like another criticism, just getting back to this, like maybe criticizing it a little bit more is that Millar really buys into the Superman as being able to do anything and everything version of Superman, which I mean, everybody and their mother talks about how like, that's kind of like his greatest weakness, right? Is that he has no weaknesses and it makes him like uninteresting. And I think, Millar kind of flirts with that a little bit in this, where he he almost makes him able to do too much. And then, you know, that's where the interesting question is, is like, so because I can do everything, that means I should, and I should be in control and doing everything. But at the same time, it makes all of his opposition like completely like unbelievable and unrealistic. Um, I don't know how I felt about that. Like, I'd be interested to hear your guys' take on like where that balance is for you and like whether or not Millar hit it, you know, like the all powerful Superman versus mere mortals yeah do you want to go for it Kenneth well uh, when it comes to Superman I feel like his intentions he probably thought were good but it ne didn't necessarily have good results because of that there wasn't a reward there for him to do that basically because his intentions may be good but that doesn't necessarily mean good results are happening because of his intentions mm -hmm. and he's kind of going down a slippery slope on some of his decision making yeah, I I found the Superman and the argument that Superman like was in this to be very problematic in so much as it is framed as a communist backdrop. So let me explain specifically. It 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 didn't make sense to me. Superman didn't make sense to me at all in this. And I hate to be the kind of guy to say like, "Oh, this is what Superman should be." But if Millar is going to embrace the Superman that can do everything, right? We see that happening a lot. We see him saving people going out of his way to do stuff. He stops but uh, Piotr or whatever his name from killing himself and like he he is very much connected at a very intimate level to everyone in the world. Like he's able to hear people screaming and go off and do all these things, right? So that's the Superman that he presents us with. Now simultaneously, he presents communism and the authoritarian state of communism to be very dehumanizing. You know, it literally turns people into these Superman robots. And it's like he 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 chalks this kind of like very authoritarian state, and those to me like clash and make no sense. Like it doesn't make sense to me that somebody who is so intimately connected and cares so deeply about everybody on Earth and is able to go and save everybody would simultaneously be the head of a government which like youth and you know uh, what's it called lobotomizes people and makes them wait in food ration lines it i didn't get it i didn't understand where that connection was coming from because it seemed like he wanted to make some comment about communism and authoritarianism being like that but i think oftentimes the reason that communism is so authoritarian is because the higher ups become disattached or de disengaged disconnected from the everyman but if superman is so intimately connected to the everyman then how is he simultaneously running a government that is so disconnected from what the Everman does? Does that yeah, make sense? Like, yeah, I really did not like, like that. It's almost like Millar was was wanting to make Superman communist without, like, giving him, like, a character flaw that would allow that to be negative. Exactly. You know? Yeah, Because if, if Superman had been, like, a little bit more conceited and a little bit more, like, I know best, you know, and a little bit more dismissive of everybody... And, like, he's saving people and doing things just because he can. And, like, maybe he enjoys the power of control like on, like, some level, you know? Mm. Then I would have... I, I could have bought into saying. it more. But yeah. it doesn't It doesn't come off as that. It comes off as, like, when he has his private moments, like, 
He's a good guy. Yeah, and it seems like he would have been raised by Russian farmers who maybe instilled the same values as the Kents did. And if that's the case, then like where that the disconnect between those two things it, it doesn't make sense to me. Like it doesn't make sense because when I read, you know, All Star Superman, which I talked about recently, like the the emotional the thing that really got me about that book and I loved was the emotional intelligence of Superman and kind of like the the really and truly interesting ways that he's balances that like need to care for everybody with the overall power. And in this it just feels like there is none of that. There is just a total disconnect between I am Mark Millar and I want to say something about communist authoritarianism versus I am Mark Millar and this is what Superman is. You know, it, it didn't it they didn't feel cohesive to me. They felt at odds with each other. And that just kept nagging me throughout the book. That was like my biggest complaint about it was that as a quote unquote Superman story, it felt hollow to me in in rationalizing why any of these things would happen from Superman's perspective. It was interesting because, like, it almost read to me like really good fan fiction. That's, a, that's exactly what I wrote in the doc, and actually. I don't have any problem with fan fiction. I love fan fiction, and I think fan fiction is super healthy. And I think a lot of what people end up writing is a lot more fan fiction than we think. But just in terms of, like, what you were saying about, like, Superman's emotional maturity in this felt, I don't know. And, and it all leads back to like how I feel about the ending, right? Because the book ends up being all about that last page and like that final line. And while that's really cool and I think it's amazing how he built that out and how it all leads there and how it really works and is so like obvious, but also not that you really get that kick in the gut. Like, oh, I should have seen that all coming. Like there is something kind of sad about a story that only lives in you on the last page. Do you know, you know what's saying? interesting is that the ending was supplied to him by Grant Morrison. Really? Yes. Yeah. I didn't know that, but that actually makes a lot of so sense. Much sense. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. I don't know if you guys felt that way, but I felt like when I put down the book for the first time, I was really like, oh my god, that ending! Like, holy shit! Like, they really like look at all these threads tying together. This is incredible. I'm so like into this. And then after, you know, the next day I was like, well, what was that book really about? You know, like there was nothing. It was just about, you know, just the inevitable, I guess, which is cool. And it was just about this massive time loop, which is also cool. Um, Did but you like, like I the, always, um... oh, sorry. It, I don't know. Like there was just no real kick to it. Did you, know? you care for the ending, Kenneth? Was that what was that on your? I really didn't dig the ending too much. I, I felt it was rushed, and it was. I felt it was very rushed. <laughs> cop out, a cop out, really. Yeah, that's what Adam said. Uh, it felt like it was rushed to an extent. Like my my feeling about it is is kind of what I said is like it felt like a high concept that is finished in a page, and like it could have been an interesting concept if it was gone into, but it just, you know, wrapped, and I I didn't find that I got satisfaction out of that. It's a cool twist, like, it's a cool concept. You know, yeah. it makes you, it, like, it makes you, it's one of those things that, like, it's almost like Max Landis, we were talking about this the other day in the podcast, like, throwing out ideas that are interesting. Like, you can hit me with that idea and I'll be like, oh, cool. But if you don't execute it with some sort of nuance, it just becomes an idea that is cool for a second and then instantly, to me, like, not very viable as like a storytelling thing. I don't know. I didn't I didn't really dig it. I think this book is exactly what you just described, like high concept in like the shortest possible format. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And for how short it was, I felt like they did absolutely the best of their ability in in this short format. But I think it all like goes back to the whole like Superman problem. Like his power ratio it almost seems to be like directly related to like his emotional maturity like you were talking about will so like mm -hmm. the more powerful he is it seems like they have to make him less and less mature and vice versa right and like character complexity is where we get the best stuff i think you could argue especially from comics or anything really i don't know why i said especially from comics but like <laughs> i don't really feel like we got that character character complexity out of this he was he was dealing with like one major problem this entire time and I don't know. I don't know if I can bring it, bring myself to be mad at this book. Yeah, like, like, I, like I said, I'm really, good. I'm really criticizing it for what it's not, and I do feel like that might not be a totally fair thing to do. Like I, you know, for what it is, for the space that it takes up, and what it accomplishes, 
I think it is fine, but it just it's frustrating to see something and feel like it could have been so much more for me. Adam just was saying how he like really liked the art. I totally agree with that. I think yeah, I really did too. I like the uh, super great. I like the Soviet era propaganda poster look on a lot of the stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very yeah. yeah. cool to look at. And there's a lot of really great character work in here because everybody ages throughout the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. I mean, it's just like an amazing, amazing rendering of these characters. And I almost want to say, like, it's some of the best Superman stuff that I've seen. Like, I feel like they really capture that, like, good old boy, like, oversized farmhand kind of a thing going <laughs> on. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, they get the strong side of Superman. You were talking about in All-Star Superman how they, there's really, like, a lot of distinction between the two. Mm -hmm. This book really, I feel like, nails, like, quintessential, like, front page of the newspaper Superman, like, on every single page. Which is good, because I think it has to do that, because there is no Clark Kent. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, there is no Russian identity of Superman um, that we are ever exposed to. There's a there's a woman in it who, like, knew him when he was younger that, that comes up, but um, without that part of Superman as being, like, kind of, you know, sneaking into the Daily Planet and, like, wearing glasses and fooling everybody, it is good that they nail what superman is artistically to make up for that i think <laughs> that's an interesting point how like you could argue that 50 percent of what superman is is clark kent and that's where like a lot of like the interesting stuff comes a lot of from great storytelling comes from clark kent's stories i think yeah. yeah and like the fact that they completely sort of took that out or that was completely like sort of forgotten you lose a lot of what makes superman interesting um can you imagine if he had been i mean maybe they kind of explain it away why he doesn't have like a secret identity, but like if he had had a secret identity in the middle of all this, mm -hmm. you know, it would have been like, really forced to the be, story. Yeah. It yeah. But if he was forced to, obviously, but like if he was forced to be one of his own subjects, I don't know what you want to call it. One of his yeah. own subordinates and like live that life, obviously more complexity of story would have come out of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, going back to the art, I do like the fact that they called back some of those famous covers that they did back in Action Comics in the 30s. Like, there were some poses that Superman had where it was clearly a, a callback to that era. Yeah, there's a panel. What's the one where he's... um The globe. And he's yeah, he's, he's lifting the daily planet. The That's exactly the picture I was, like, thinking of. This one right here, if you guys can see. It's yeah, so there's, good. There's, like, a lot of... It, and it's cool to see that kind of classic imagery repurposed for you know something that's un-american in the sense of you know like the, the the in a literal sense is just from across the pond i guess do you want to talk a little bit about um batman and uh green lantern and some of the other characters did you um what did you think about them kenneth like this being an else else world story um did you find them to be like engaging and that they were because those were probably the two that were like the most fleshed out besides wonder woman which we already kind of discussed as being disappointing yeah, I liked Batman. I liked his cool hat, and I liked his, uh, <laughs> I liked his uh, kind of an anarchist sort of V for Vendetta sort of image he had going there. I really dug that. His yeah. redesign for me was like the best thing. Like I, I, out of all of like the imagery, his was like, ugh, that's so smart. Yeah, I agree. And also his like his storyline, like his his new origin. Obviously, was the most fleshed out besides Superman, but I almost yeah. like more than Superman. Like I, I did like it too because it gave him a specific vendetta against, um, like the state. Like it, and because in his in this origin, his parents are like printing anti-Superman propaganda, and they're kind of just like gunned down by um, uh, a is it was it Piotr who killed him? Peter the I don't remember who killed him. It was either um him or like a KGB person or whatever but either way um he his parents are killed and so he becomes like this like uh kenneth was saying kind of like a v style anarchist um and i think it did make an interesting uh kind of like parallel to bruce wayne's billions in america as we usually see him right i saw the alan moore influence for sure yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely um the Green Lantern stuff, did you guys like that? It was almost, like, too short to, like, have a character. It kind of came out of nowhere, yeah. 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 I was kind of, I don't know, kind of tapped out by that point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. 
Um, and I'm trying to think about the other main point that I wrote down on this was. Oh, I'm totally forgetting it right now. Oh, Lex. Lex Luthor and the Lois Lane relationship and everything. What were you guys' thoughts on that? I don't know. I think, I think Lois was kind of shoved in there. They didn't, really didn't have to have her with Lex Luthor at all. They could yeah. just had Lex by himself. I thought that was kind of, kind of forced in there. Yeah, I mean, like another example, like... I I haven't read much Miller, but I don't know if he's ever had a woman do anything in his comics. Maybe I, yeah, and the Jimmy Olsen vice president thing was kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of weird. <laughs> he, was like, he, was, he was in love with Jimmy Olsen in this book. Yeah, like, there was, was so much Jimmy Olsen in this book. And you can see where Zack Snyder got that influence for Batman v Superman with Jimmy Olsen being a CIA agent and everything. Oh, what the hell. <laughs> Yeah, that was actually one of the funny things when I was reading the Wikipedia page on this before we started. There's a line at the bottom of it that says um, Henry Cavill based his Superman on um, on this. He said oh, it was one of the four comics. That's that gave why him it was an interesting. That's exactly what I thought. One of the four comics that gave him inspiration and insight for portraying Superman in his um, films. And as soon as I read that, I was like, "Well, that explains a lot about why Superman is so stunted in the movies." Like. <laughs> you know, it, it, he because he kind of is stunted in this book to some extent. Um, and I feel bad because I I don't feel like it's the character's fault. No, it's not. You know, like this character could have done a lot of cool things and like did do a lot of cool things. I would argue. Okay, just going back to the whole like Lex Luthor Superman thing, I felt like it was one of the stronger, if not the strongest, relationship in the book. It obviously was like the crux of all the conflict, and like the whole like idea of like this chess match between Lex and like a, you know, a Superman is interesting, and for the most part, I bought and like I enjoyed. Um, I like the idea of like Lex being challenged by somebody like slowly drive that like that's what slowly like kind of drives him mad, and like Superman's just unrelenting goodness is what kind of pushes him into this sort of like crazy dark place you know mm. like the propensity for being like a maniacal super genius you know killer person was like always there but like superman just existing like his very existence is what forced him to become that like i think that's an interesting question or an interesting thesis right and maybe i'm like reading too much into it but like that part of it i really really enjoyed and like the last page makes it almost more about like lex than about superman like lex is yeah it turns out that the Le impetus like, for everything yeah over the course of like hundreds of millions of years that the lex luthor line continues to flourish and then eventually the luthor gets shortened to l <laughs> Which is where Jor-El Jor comes from. And I was like, ooh, I don't know about that. That was that just because that was kind of weird. But uh, yeah, like I guess eventually then the Jor-El is like one of the descendants of Luthor who sends his son Kal-El back in time. So in this universe, there was no Krypton. It was a time loop where baby Superman is brought back to fight Grandpa Lex. To fight Grandpa Lex, sort of. Yeah, I guess. Um, Chelsea Cheese Alter says, I like that Red Sun actually gave Lex with a reason to play the antagonist to Superman, other than Lex just being evil. And I think that's a really good point. Like, imagine if this book had all been from Lex's perspective. Yeah, you don't and, like, see Superman him had start been, like, out an that often. Character. Yeah. Like, that would have fixed a lot of the things we were talking about. Like, we're, we're, we're looking for character complexity. And if, if Miller really wanted to play this Superman so straight then he needed to have some kind of complex antagonist, protagonist point of view thing going on, which I, I feel like he didn't. It makes it sound like I don't like this. I would recommend <laughs> this to people. Like, I would tell people to read this. I enjoyed this. We'll get to that at the end. That'll be the last thing we talk <laughs> okay. about. But I do think you're right. Like, we, it's unusual to see Lex as you see him at the beginning of this book. You know, full head of hair wife to or husband to Lois Lane and like just a genuinely kind of good person like you, you you sort of see him like solving all these problems and kind of like giving out all of this insight and stuff and like I, I do I think you're right like the Lex in this I, I did enjoy and I wish it had been a little more focused on him 
Right. I agree. Yeah. Do you have um like final criticism slash thoughts, either of you, about this before we kind of wrap into the end of it? It's almost indicative that like there's not much more to say. <laughs> I know, this isn't the yeah. deepest book. It's pretty short too. Like I don't know what kind of like it's almost like we wanted to read Planetary, but we read Red Sun instead. You, you know what I'm saying? Like we wanted like 600 pages of comic goodness, and we read 50. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it started out as a great idea, a great concept with good art, but at the end, it just fizzled to me. Yeah, I I actually it's like my my hope of it when I opened it, and I thought it was going to be take an interesting direction is, and I think it could have been really interesting if. Like, do you know? Do you remember the scenes in Watchmen where Doctor Manhattan is being used in like Vietnam and stuff? Yeah, I think there's like, I think there's a really interesting story somewhere in here, where we take as Americans Superman to just be a representative of us so well that if it had focused more on like people in America and how they perceive kind of like the threat of Russia as being very powerful and like very scary now that Superman exists. I think it could have been interesting because it's one thing to say like, you know, in the Dr. Manhattan thing, example, for, for example, you know, when you see him tearing up Vietnam and you sort of see like the terror from the Vietnamese perspective, that's an interesting idea. But like, I think for a lot of comic book readers, they probably don't identify or put themselves in the shoes of like Vietnamese soldiers. You know, like it's not, it's not like a very identifiable character archetype, but I think like what I was hoping this book was going to do was to kind of take it and show like, how truly terrifying it would be for Superman to be in a different country, even if his intentions are good. You know, because, like, he doesn't necessarily have explicitly bad intentions, but it's still, like, he's still a terrifying force just in his existence. And so, like, I was hoping that that's what this was going to do, and I felt like it kind of let me down a little bit in that by focusing, like, a little more on Superman and a little bit less on the things... Everybody else. Yeah, that are ancillary to him that were more interesting. That are affected by him. Yeah. That was, that was Adam real. made a really good point. He says, I feel like Miller can't commit to his characters enough to flesh them out. Like, that almost sums it, sums it up, like, completely, you know? He's mm -hmm. like, guys, I have this amazing idea. What if Supermo is a communist? Give me, like, four issues and I'll just do it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that's total. like, it's almost like Miller doesn't even like his characters. Or doesn't see them as people. Yeah, I they're think just like sort of they're just sort of like blocks, his... blocks to like move around and play with to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. Although I would say Mark, Mark made this point earlier in the comments, and I do agree with him because I have read like um, Starlight from Millar, and I've heard that MPH is good as well. I think he does better creating his own things, like if it's you know Kingsman or Wanted or Kickass or MPH or Starlight, he yeah. he does a better job without having that baggage because like even if this is supposed to be an elseworld story you know even if it is in name supposed to leave behind continuity it, he still is beholden to some extent to making his batman his superman and whatever you know and the kind of like following through the archetypes and if he doesn't have to do that like mark was saying in the comments if he is able to just construct from the ground up i think he can make something interesting i think he just like gets bogged down when he's dealing with stuff that exists already, you know, like the Ultimates, for example, um, when he's dealing with stuff that exists already, he makes kind of wooden versions of those characters that you might have seen better other places. But if he has his own free will, he can kind of express a little bit of his interesting ideas without you feeling like there's too much baggage. If that makes sense. <laughs> it's weird because, like, thinking about the ending now, like, the whole thesis of the book was, like, what if Superman tried to control everything? Like, what would that look like? And that wasn't ever really answered. You know what I mean? Like, the whole, th the whole like, inner monologue of Superman was, like, I need to, like, get control of everything. Is that a good thing to do? Is that a bad thing to do? And then he never, like, found an answer within himself. Lex just kind of won. And Superman just kind of went away. Yeah, yeah, and then Superman just kind of voluntarily was like, well, I guess I'll let them decide for me. You know? Like, I cannot make this decision, even though I am apparently, like, able within a minute to, like, become, like, a medical doctor. I don't have enough complexity of thought to, like, decide this on my own, even though, like, I have been deciding like, this whole time, like, very obviously. 
I don't know. It, it's like this weird juxtaposition because he kept acting one way and then having these internal monologues where he's like, but should I be doing this? And you're like, yeah. no, like you shouldn't. Like, isn't that fairly obvious at this point? But this is like a bad <laughs> idea. I don't know. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it's funny we mentioned Grant Morrison in this. That casts a huge shadow over this book for me. I All-Star agree. Superman. I actually agree with that. Yeah. I mean, All Star Superman by far is the best Superman story to me. I agree with that as well. And I and I do think you're right. Like having that shadow over it and seeing where you can take this makes stories where you don't take it just feel all the cheaper. Which is unfortunate. Like I, I don't think it I don't think having a great Superman story like All Star means that nobody should try and write Superman anymore. Like I don't want that to happen, but but it is sort of inescapable in this, especially when you kind of know that Morrison and Millar are, you know, friends in real life and kind of getting that influence of like, oh, this feels like it could be a little Morrison-y, but just a surface level Morrison. It, it, it did rub me on that. I agree, Kenneth. So final thoughts, Kenneth, would you recommend this? Is this a, is this like a buy or is this a pass for you? What, what would you say to a comic book reader out there? I definitely recommend it. Again, if, if you're not a Superman fan, it's definitely something to read. Um, even as, if you don't have a ba- just a basic knowledge on the character. Uh, I like the Elseworld sort of what if sort of scenario. I do think it's a buy, just to have and so in uh, for the art alone. I think the art is good. Mm. Yeah, Amani. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think it's totally worth your time. It's fun. It's quick. Like you're not investing hours and hours and hours into something that's not going to pay off. The art is gorgeous, and the Elseworld, the Elseworld stuff was for me like the most enjoyable part, and I had a good time with that. You know, yeah, I agree. I think for me, the, my favorite part was the art. I did like it a lot, and I liked that it was colored the way it was. Like, I felt like it really captured a tone of like moving from the you know 30s into the 40s, into the 50s, into the 60s, into the 70s. Like, you sort of see all those pieces, and the art and is like has more of an illustration quality, and especially the coloring is like really clean and um and nicely indicative of those time periods. I, I did like that part of it a lot. Um. I don't know if it's a buy for me. I think what Amani, you're right. Like, ultimately, it's not a big time investment. So, if you're looking for like a fun kind of throwaway story, I'd say check it out. But um, I don't think it uses its characters in a way that I found personally enjoyable. So, like, if I had never read this, I don't think I would have. I don't think I got much out of it. I think it was a fun. It was a fun little read, but. I didn't find it to be very elucidating about any of the characters or the world or anything just outside of, you know, like I was saying earlier, Millar kind of nudging you in the rib and being like, see what I did? See what I did? Isn't this kind of cool? Like, see how Batman wears a funny hat? Like, see? Which, I mean, you know, can be fun. It's a fun distraction. It's just not a main course for me. It was definitely worth the seven fifty I paid for it at Second Charles. <laughs> that's, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> that's totally fair. So, with that... We end our first Nerd Ventures book club stream. Good job, guys. Thank you so much, Kenneth, for helping us. I really, yeah, really appreciated thank you it. For coming, dude. Yes, and we hope to see you on many, many more of these in the future. Yeah. Speaking of which, next month we are going to do Identity Crisis. Oh. Identity Crisis. So, the part of the reason we are doing this is because um, it, it is, I think, a good time to be reading Identity Crisis. I think. Uh, because the absolute infinite crisis is coming out in, I believe, December, um, I think it will be a good time for people to, if you haven't read it or if you have read it before, to catch up on that and then to kind of move into infinite crisis. Um, and I also think it is kind of like a thicker novel-esque book that will be a good discussion for the book club. Um, after that, we will be opening stuff up to voting for Patreon contributors. Which, by the way, you should absolutely check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash nerdventures. Um, if you are like Kevin and would like to co host Kevin, <laughs> if you are like Kenneth, I'm sorry, Kenneth, no and problem. would like to uh, co host this book club with us, there are spots available for that. We have more spots for co hosts in um, certain reward tiers. We also have different tiers for um, voting and contributing content to the channel, to the podcast, and to the book club as well as little shout out and other ancillary tiers that are just really fun um, kind of different donation goals for super fans of the channel. So uh, where can we find you guys, Kenneth? Do you have a uh, 
presence on the interwebs where we can follow you and you talk about comics at all? Um, just starting out, I'm on Twitter at, at Kenneth Mayner, uh, okay. M-A-Y-N-E-R. Um, I should have a YouTube up soon. I'll probably put some, like, you know, omnibus things on there and things like that in the awesome. near future. Yeah, that's perfect. And, and you can definitely find Kenneth on our uh, monthly book clubs in the meantime where he will be further elucidating these amazing stories with us. I think that's the third time I've used elucidate in this podcast. You're liking that word today. I am liking that word today. And Imani, where can we find you? Um, you can find me under the number Nerd How on YouTube, Tumblr, and Twitter. All right, guys. <laughs> you didn't finish it. Oh, no. No podcast. <laughs> yeah, so thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, like I said, next month, come back. At the end of the month, on a Wednesday night, we will be doing Identity Crisis, talking all about that and about sort of the read-up from Identity to Infinite Crisis. And uh, we are going to stop, at this point, the Superman Red Sun discussion and just stick around for a couple of minutes. And if anybody in the comments wants to leave us Q&As, um, about anything related to comic books or the channel or the podcast or anything like that, please feel free to throw stuff in the comment box and we will hang around and just have like a nice little uh, discussion with you guys.